I will tell one more story and then I'll let you speak for 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I mean, exactly. I mean, the main character keeps getting killed. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now trying to think of ways how I can help to make it more inclusive for people. As a queer person. I don't know why I feel like I have to say that with, like, a flourish. <laughs> if people are noticing the, uh, the backing singers there, then the front man isn't very charismatic, <laughs> is there? Is there is... Matters. Try again, fail again, never mind, fail better. He revealed all of what you saw on that interview. These were about 500 years old, that's the brilliant thing. Nothing came back, song after song after song uh, after Boris song. Johnson used the fact that he never stopped being a journalist. That's why he should never have been Prime Minister. To secure your tickets to a live recording of Tortoise Lates, visit tortoisemedia.com forward slash book. Let him know that we know where he lives, we know the way that he goes to his office, and uh, London is a very dark city in the middle of night. I'm Paul Karana Galizia. Iran trying to assassinate people in Britain isn't a story that I thought I'd ever cover. The counter-terrorism police told me that I had to inform my children's school about the threats. When reporting my last podcast series, London Grad, an investigation into Russian money in London, I began to see the city in a completely different light. And that is the moment I realized, okay, my life in London that I used to think was safe uh, 
is no longer the same. He said that counter-terrorism police officers working with the security service, so MI5, intercepted five assassination or abduction plots since November 2022. It doesn't surprise me at all, and clearly the number of escalation from 10 to 15, that is what the DG of MI5 is revealing publicly. I would, if anything, suggest that's quite a low number. This story isn't only about freedom of the press, and it isn't just about Iran. It's about Britain and who the country protects and why. From Tortoise, this is Series 2 of London Grad, Iran's Hit Squad. Right, that means it's time to start. Welcome, everybody. I hope you've all got drinks. I ha oh, I have, yes, I've got the option of a drink. That's good. Um, my name's Giles Whittell. I'm an editor here at Tortoise. It's great to see so many of you have uh, actually made the in real world, in IRL, in real life trek to, to our newsroom. We're joined by some other people online. And uh, we're joined more specifically by Dr. Julia Grace Patterson. And I'm going to see if I can remember all your different titles. Medical doctor, first of all. Founder and uh, chief executive of Every Doctor and author of Critical. Why the NHS is being betrayed and how we can fight for it. It is a goldmine of detail about what's going on in the NHS. For me, it's also, I have to say a little depressing because I have a son who's just qualified for medical school after four years of trying. And to read it and think about what you went through as a junior doctor, what all the other junior doctors go through, um, and the prognosis for the service, and wonder um, about that as a workplace for someone that close to me, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of us have had these kinds of, these kinds of thoughts. But anyway, um, before we get into it on everything that's on your mind and in your book, um, ground rules, this is a, it's builders in conversation with, but it's a thinking. We're going to run it like a, a tortoise thinking. So please, all of you, raise your hand at any point. You don't have to wait till the end. Please don't wait till the end, because then you'll think of things that you wanted to say, and there won't be any time for it. That yellow tortoise will tell us how we're doing in relation to the time, and when the flag, flag goes up at the end, it's kind of time up. So if there's anything that you want to ask or just say uh, which you think I'm not getting to, or even if I am, or if I'm getting it wrong, just pitch in. Um, but broadly speaking, Julia, your analysis, it's pretty uncompromising. It, it is that the health service is collapsing. Um, not only that, but that it's deliberate in a sense. It's as a result of policy over, over many decades, but principally recently, and that it needs to go back to its roots if it's to survive keeping to its existing, existing constitution. Can you start by outlining for us how you see that collapse happening? What are the ingredients of that collapse? And, and you were mm -hmm. saying just before we came up um, from, from downstairs that that um, quite a lot of the work that you're doing with every doctor is on uh, new, newly observed systemic prom mm -hmm. problems, which you see. Tell us about them, but, but more broadly, um, sketch out your, how you see the services collapsing. Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, just to clarify first, I'm not currently working as a medical doctor. Oh, I always like qualified. to say, no, uh, yeah, I yeah. am qualified. I always like to say that just because um, there are many doctors in the audience here today and um, and they're doing such an amazing job. So I'm I'm not working on the front line. I just want to state that. Um, OK, so the really big question and <laughs> I've covered it in the book, but um, we've at every doctor we've been tackling systemic problems in the NHS for the last four years or so now. And when we started, we were a small collective of UK doctors who saw problems 
and saw that individuals working in the service or individual hospitals were being scapegoated for problems which weren't specific to those individuals or workplaces, they actually were systemic problems. And so if there was a failure in one place, for example, an A&E was overrun or a maternity unit you know, had understaffing or um, there were failures with ambulances arriving in the hospital or any of these things, we found through the network that we were building that the same thing would be happening in multiple places across, the, across England, but also across the entire UK. And what we became interested in doing is highlighting the fact that these systemic problems needed to be tackled. And so we had a really firm focus on trying to involve politicians from across the political spectrum in our work, um, bringing stories to the press and um, calling for solutions. And we did that pretty diligently for three, four years. Um, we've run over 25 parliamentary briefings. We ran a really big campaign during the pandemic that was called Protect NHS Workers, and we worked with over 100 MPs across the political spectrum. We've got a lot of experience now looking at what happens when you call attention to a problem, which is systemic, and then how politicians react. <coughs> And we have a really wide network of people who get involved in these campaigns. We run a network of about 400,000 people. And what we have noticed happen over the last two years, probably since the pandemic, is there's been a shift where politicians are less engaging in the problems in the service. During the pandemic, there were opportunities for us to campaign and do cross-party work and make changes. We secured some changes. You describe in the book how those briefings were attended by dozens of MPs from both parties. Yes, yeah, some yeah. of the, I mean, we started small. It was an enormous challenge because all of the MPs were working from home. We assembled a team of volunteers. We telephoned every single MP office every single week. It was an extraordinary task that happened when, you know, no one was used to Zoom, right? But, um, you know, we started with maybe 20 MPs coming and then it was 30 and then it was 40 and then it was 50. And um, I still maintain links with a lot of those MPs. There are some fantastic politicians in this country, but the parties, the parties are not working to change the things systemically that need to be changed. And sorry to answer the question that, uh, that you put to me, because we've been doing this work now for three or four years and we've been picking up on the problems each time and running these briefings and monitoring who attends and who doesn't and who lobbies in parliament and who doesn't and what questions are asked in prime minister's questions, all of these things, we've got an absolute mine of information about how the political parties are responding. And as we came into the winter that we've just come out of, we recognized through our network that things were gonna be really, really bad this winter so much so that we prepped a campaign ahead of time. We prepped it in October that was called Revive the NHS. And we worked with lots of artists, animators, filmmakers to create materials ahead of time because we knew it was gonna be a terrible situation and we wanted to get prepared and raise the alarm about what was happening. And we ran three emergency parliamentary briefings over the winter period. Now, I bet people here will remember what happened, but the NHS truly did collapse this winter. We had a situation, sorry, Giles. No, I, I, I'm sort of sharp intake of breath because I, I, I'm just being a pedant here. And one of my jobs here is to sort of to edit people's copy. If it had truly collapsed, then it would, it kind of wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, it's, I, I mean, my question is, what are, what are the key um, components of this collapse? Are we talking about, I mean, we're all familiar with the headlines, aren't we? The waiting lists, um, the, uh, the time spent waiting for emergency care, the um, backlogs for um, elective surgeries. Uh, how, do you, how do you, what do you think is the most valid way of quantifying the health or, or ill health of the service? So first of all, I think there's a problem with us talking about one NHS crisis one winter and then another NHS crisis, and it kind of takes on this sort of monotonous energy about it. And we talk about waiting lists and we talk about time, time waiting for an ambulance. But what gets lost when that is the discussion is what is happening in that intervening time. Because if you think about it, if you're asking how do we quantify whether this service is working or yeah. not, the NHS is meant to provide safe, comprehensive, effective care for every person in this country. And this winter we had a situation okay. where 
people were calling ambulances that didn't turn up before they died. We had a situation, you know, our members told us what was going on day to day. It was absolutely horrifying. There were A&E doctors telling us that the beds were being pulled out of bed spaces to enable six or seven chairs to be put in each cubicle. There was life-saving treatment being delivered on the floor of the A&E department. There were situations where there weren't enough beds on wards and so they were ramming extra beds up against the fire exits. Those beds didn't have any access to oxygen. We had GPs telling us that patients had had a severe fall at home and were turning up at the GP three days later with a broken hip because the ambulance had never turned up. There were up to 500 patients dying every single week because they couldn't access urgent care. And that's from the Royal College of Emergency yeah. Medicine. And so that, to my mind, is the collapse of our healthcare system. And that is what needs to be spoken about. And it's not being spoken about because politicians don't want to talk about it. That's not just the current government. We haven't found any party who are wanting to talk about that. And that's why I've written the book. And actually, what was really difficult this winter Sorry, whenever I talk about this, I cry because I find it really, really difficult. It was incredibly difficult running a network of people, hearing from doctors on the front line about what was going on, running these emergency parliamentary briefings, turning up and bringing frontline doctors to these meetings when they had a thousand other things they could have been doing for their patients those days, and recognising that a dozen MPs turned up, or 15 MPs. The 650 MPs in our, in you know, in the UK, where were the other 630 MPs? Because it was a humanitarian crisis. And, and was there a point towards the end of the um, pandemic when you sensed that bipartisan, to use the American phrase, uh, political interest from MPs dissolving and uh, going? to the current situation which you describe of much lower levels of interest and um, senior politicians from both parties refusing to engage with what you see as the, the gravity of the argument. I mean, mm -hmm. Did that roughly coincide with the end of the pandemic? Did everyone just heave a sigh of relief? I think it's more complicated than that. The, the pandemic definitely does, does play into it a lot. So when the pandemic started up, um, because it was such an extraordinary event, um, there was the sense that politicians were acting out of what they thought was right. And we noticed that there was a lot of cross-party working on emergency issues, like, for example, the provision of safe PPE, the provision of death in service benefit. We saw lots of um, MPs lobbying together about mental health care provision for the staff, this sort of thing. It was actually really impressive. Um, mm -hmm. The barriers seemed to come down between political parties. Now, I'm probably being slightly generous because um, the Conservative Party had a handful of politicians doing that. Um, I think very highly of them. You know, I was having phone calls with some of their backbenchers who were taking time out of their busy schedules to talk to a campaigning organisation who probably mm -hmm. didn't see eye, see eye to eye on, you know, a lot of things. But, but that work was going on. Labour were extremely powerful during the pandemic for that reason because groups of the MPs were working together on particular issues. But coming out of the pandemic, the sense we have actually is that Labour has become more organised in its messaging, mm -hmm. particularly in their manifesto proposals for the next general election and beyond. And we feel that that has actually put down barriers and we're getting less engagement from Labour MPs than we used to, um, which is hugely concerning. Um, and this winter, when I was talking about those emergency parliamentary briefings we ran, the way that we do that is we invite MPs, we send out invitations, we wait and see what messages come back. Um, sometimes we involve the public and we send thousands of letters to MPs as a massive group. And then what often happens is the members of the public will send us what they get back from their MP. So we're able to track it and we keep documents, archives of all of the, it's very arduous, but it's useful. You can watch what they do over time. We keep these documents showing the hundreds of MP responses and we look for stock replies from the parties. We didn't used to get those stock responses that right. were created by central communications departments from Labour. It used to be clearly that MP writing what they thought in an email. Yeah. But now we get sort of, sorry to hear you're concerned, beyond the next election, we're going to fix X, Y and Z. And that, to us, from the opposition, the political opposition, that's really concerning. 
But it, I mean, it's interesting. It's also perhaps not surprising. I mean, we were talking about this just before we started, weren't yeah. we? A, a, a symptom of a risk averse party desperate to control messaging uh, in the build up to an election that is really theirs to lose. I think you're absolutely right. I also find it devastating yeah. because I think there's a lot of chat about what campaigners do and that we're political, that we're activists, that we're troublemakers, that we're rabble rousing. We're a group of doctors, you know, yeah. we're, we're not political by background really. We're interested in systemic problems and calling attention to patient safety and staff safety and the recognition that politicians are putting political ambition above the safety of the public is really horrifying to us. Mm. You know, that's really horrifying and it's scary. And one doctor actually tweeted over the winter and it's stuck with me, I suppose. The number of people dying this winter because they couldn't access safe healthcare is the same number of people who would die if a jumbo jet crashed every single week and mm -hmm. everybody on board died. And yet, you know, are we talking about it? Is it in the media? I've not seen anything recently about it. You know, and it's June and we know what happens. It goes slightly quieter in the summer and mm -hmm. then it will ramp up again in the autumn and we'll be in the same position, I suspect. Well, your, your description of, of the collapse um, is pretty compelling. I find that 500 uh, excess uh, avoidable deaths per week pretty compelling and the source is the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. So. Uh, I, I buy that, but let, let's go back a bit to, to the roots of the crisis. Um, in the middle of the book, you have a chapter headed Method, which basically itemizes how this is being done. A key component of that is, um, is the burdensome cost of PFI, uh, uh, what is it, 50 billion a year? No, it's not 50 No, billion. it's not 50 not billion. It's several billion there's a, a year. There's a total debt burden of 50 billion for PFI hospitals yeah. built a long time ago. Right. But, but I'm particularly interested in the outsourcing. And, and I recommend to everybody the um, Every Doctor interactive map uh, in which you can zoom in and see where in the, in the whole of the UK. Yes. Although uh, it is primarily England that this yeah. has become a problem. Uh, services being outsourced and so when you when you zoom out the whole map is covered in red uh, splodges which indicate services being outsourced I went into my local hospital Kings in South East London and um, and there's there's a, a useful reference to via path uh, um, an outsourcer doing pathology mm -hmm. blood screening mm -hmm. I guess so my question is um, isn't that in a sense, something quite sensible about finding the most cost-effective way, given the service will always be um, pushed for cash. I mean, they will always be competing for, for public funds to find the most cost-effective way of doing those services. Um, well, there has been some information shared to show that it's not more cost-effective in various ways. Um, the administrative costs of um, running these tendering contracts is, is really high. Um, and you're right in the sense that the NHS budget gets bigger and bigger every year and there are inefficiencies. But I think the question is bigger than that, quite frankly. I think if you can... You know, that, that's the problem that politicians sometimes get themselves into, I think. They think in a short-term way about what seems cost-effective from one year to the other. And you lose that broader, really important um, point, which is that when the system is connected and linked up and run publicly, there's a lot of collaborative working that can mm. benefit patients. And you lose all of the bureaucracy and problems that cause when when you churn these contracts because a lot of these contracts are short term right, right. so i don't know about viapath actually no, it's just an example. i think they've been working there for a while but yeah. but lots of these contracts are entered into for a short period of time by private providers or other non-profit providers and they can exit if it isn't you know financially viable for right. them or attractive in other ways and if you think about it from a patient's perspective particularly the ones with chronic illness that causes a lot of upheaval problems, it causes problems to staff, it causes continuity problems. Um, 
And I, I don't think it's properly thought through, really. Um, I think if we really wanted to save money in the NHS, we need to look at it as a system as a whole. How much value does it have to the public? You know, there's a lot of talk about the cost, but there's not a lot of talk about value. Mm -hmm. And when you look at any poll from the public about, you know, what are the public services that are the most meaningful to you or what, what do you value the most in our society, the NHS is right there at the top, right? And so why don't politicians place that importance on it in a long-term way, in a sustainable way that's going to Im improve people's lives? Sorry, am I, am I missing? Hi. Yeah. CEO of Frontline 19. We support the NHS and Frontlines with free counselling and we've done so for the last nearly four years. Yeah. I wanted to come at this from a patient perspective because my dad has kidney failure and has dialysis and he was recently in King's. Fantastic hospital. However, when it came to him stepping down from his treatment and needing dialysis in the community but still needing to be in hospital, they weren't able to do it because the contract says this and they can't go outside the parameters of that. So the first time my dad had dialysis, he had to go from a Kent hospital right the way up into London with um, quite significant delirium, very, very poorly, with a raging sepsis-type infection, and it was a 12-hour round trip. And my dad is in his late 70s, has got heart problems. He's got quite complex medical needs. I ended up having to fight tooth and nail to get him a local provision. And I even did all the phoning around to all the different private suppliers say, could you do this in the community? Can you? And in the end, he'd been in bed for two months in mm -hmm. Kings. We ended up having to do it in a chair in a dialysis unit out in Bromley, which really wasn't fit for what he needed, but it was the only option we had. And there are many, many patients. There's a guy that comes from Tunbridge Wells right the way up to Bromley. It takes over an hour, and he has to do that three times a week. And right. the dialysis takes four hours. You add the travelling time and the waiting time. These people are losing days and days and days. And the thing is, it isn't cost-effective. So just to be clear, the dialysis pro is provided by uh, a private firm? Yeah. It is? Yeah. Many but of them are. obviously free to you. It is free to us, but it's, it's, it's very inflexible because, again, they have very set contracts about yeah. what they can and can't do. But also, when you look at the, the areas that they cover, and even if you look at the transport provision, because at the end of dialysis, you are exhausted. It's like you've run a marathon and people need to go home and rest overnight and, and kind of, you know, you've got yeah. people that are very sick. And this affects all age groups. And these people are having to do hour, two hour, three hour journeys back home again. And you've obviously looked into this um, from the research that you've done. Do you have any sense of how this would have been handled 10 years ago? It would have been something where somebody, because it's any kind of public sector, it's about talking to someone else and saying, we've got this patient, this is what we need, can you help? No, but so-and-so can. And it's that community of the whole kind of NHS together. Now it is completely fractured and split apart. One part doesn't know what the other part's doing. So the dialysis part doesn't always correlate with the, the hospital that you're in. <clears throat> it's a really, really important point. Right. If you think about the NHS as a system, it's a load of interlinked services and those services talk to one another all the time because patients are often using multiple services at the same time and their ability, everybody's ability within the staff to provide a good service for patients does come down to how effective those relationships are between mm -hmm. different teams. If you've got changing teams or teams who, like you were describing, are very limited in what they can provide and you have to come this way and you've got to book transport but oh no the transport hasn't turned up for 10 hours often the person who loses out is a patient you know yeah. and i think a lot of this is short-termist quite frankly there's a lot of focus at the moment on patient choice you know politicians say oh po patients should choose between where they want to go for their treatment Quite frankly, I think most patients would be quite happy going to their local facility if it, if it worked. I mean, I don't think, from, from my experience, I don't think patients are that fussed about choosing as long as they have a decent service where they are. Close but and but they don't, yeah. a lot of them don't at the moment. And the choice isn't there. No. Just, I phoned round 16, 17 hospitals to try and get him dialysis so he could move closer to home. My mum's in her late 70s. You know, we tried everything. 
And the same with the transport. They awarded a new contract to SVL, which is a transport company. Right. It was absolute chaos. People were waiting seven, eight hours to be taken home. But nobody ever goes back to these contracts as actually, that's not good enough. What are you going to do about it? It's like, once you've got the contract for that period of time, that's it. And it only gets re-looked really at when it comes up for tender again. So the patient you loses any kind of choice. It's like, well, that's all there is. So you've just got to get on with it. This is really interesting. Thank you very much. <coughs> Suddenly the volume seems to have gone up. Maybe that's... Um, maybe I, my hearing has suddenly got better. Um, uh, but from what I'm hearing and from what the book says, a lot of this creeping privatisation, if we can use that as a shorthand, is ad hoc. It's short-term contracts uh, awarded by uh, regional or local trusts. Am I right? Um, there is that aspect of it, definitely. I agree. It sounds like it's getting louder. <laughs> There's, um, so in the book, what I describe is that over the last four decades, there's been various reforms of the NHS that have been implemented, and each of those reforms have allowed more and more privatisation to infiltrate the service. So first of all, there was an open marketplace that was introduced yeah. between services to competing with one another, and we've moved on now to the thousands of outsourced services run by private healthcare providers and others. Um, and you can see it that these are sort of individual coming in and competitively winning a tender, but systemically there's also changes happening that are making it easier and easier for the private companies to come in now. So last year the Health and Care Act 2022, 2022. came in and that broke the NHS in England up into 42 what are called integrated care systems. Yeah. And each of these reforms just fragments the system further and further we're starting to hear um, from tendering happening at the moment as well, where it's easier for the big private providers to come in and win bids rather than the existing NHS services because they're very slick and very good at filling out these application forms and looking absolutely fantastic. And there was a GP surgery up in Lancashire a few months ago where the existing GP who'd been working in her village surgery for many years and was very well thought of and had really great satisfaction ratings with her patients lost or looked like she was going to lose a bid against a private healthcare provider coming in and the local patients were really cross about this and pushed back and she's been temporarily allowed to keep her contract but the marking criteria for who wins a bid makes it a lot easier for these big companies with fantastic HR departments to win bids compared to you know single GP working a partnership on her own I mean so over right. time Yes, that, yes, it's individual circumstances. You can look at it like that. Mm -hmm. But across the country, I mean, you've only got to look at that map to see what's going on. It's, it's, it's growing. I mean, it's, it's happening more and more. Let me put to you what a doctor said to me today um, when I mentioned that we were going to be having this chat. Uh, let me get this right. Um, forgive me. Um, no, you don't want to go down the American route, in other words, wholesale privatization, but no one re really believes that's happening. Have we seen some, excuse the technical language, shite uh, uh, public-private partnerships? Yes, especially during COVID. Uh, the one with uh, Michelle Moan, another uh, technical term, us. Um, but he, he said uh, that privatization versus full public ownership a la 1948 is not the debate it's how you shape that partnership in other words um, um, there is another view from staunch defenders of of the service that that this partnership with the private sector is kind of inevitable do you agree or or do you um, either fundamentally disagree or find that, as a campaigning organisation, you've got to keep the message simple? I don't think it's to keep the message simple, because no. we're not politicians. <laughs> I, mean, no. we're, um, I mean, I suppose what I would suggest is that we look at the evidence that's coming out. We're not ideologically opposed to privatisation for any kind of political reason. The reason our organisation are opposed to it is because we believe it's bringing harm to patients right. and harm to staff, actually. There's instances now where um, private providers are taking over services and staff are having a bad time of it. 
but um, there was a study, we were talking about this before we came in, weren't we? An observational study came out in The Lancet last year. It's the first study of its kind, and it looked at the impact of private companies running NHS services. And there was an excess mortality increase, which means that avoidable deaths look like they've happened in an increased way in the areas that have had more private outsourcing going on. Now, we're in the early days with this, and I think when you're in the early days of a systemic change of the magnitude that's happening at the moment, you know, I don't want to say something with absolute certainty when this observational study is the first of its kind, but what's coming out looks really worrying. And anecdotally, you know, we run a network of 400,000 people. You wouldn't believe the number of stories we're hearing from patients who just anecdotally are having a bad experience. I think that needs to be paid attention to. Um, I think you will sometimes pe have people saying, oh, you know, the NHS has always had a degree of privatisation or this is inevitable. But any of this, this is inevitable, is, to my mind, nonsense because the NHS itself wasn't inevitable. No public healthcare system is. Right. You know, we could we could rebuild it the way we wanted it to be. Yes, uh, which leads neatly on to this this question of of solutions, and and your solutions. There's a whole chapter on them, are uh, ambitious and expensive, aren't they? Um, uh, first of all, you say you've got to get staff to return, uh, revive capex, invested investment programs across the service pay off that um, PFI debt, and then end outsourcing, update the tech and the estate, and um, pay proper attention to the diversity in leadership. Mm -hmm. Basically, and, and, and fundamental to that is go back to full public funding of the whole service. Confession time. In a previous job, I used to be part of the sort of media blob that wrote uh, some of these sort of opinion pieces for the Times, not under my own name, channeling the view of the paper, uh, which I don't think were ideological, but they did ask the question, how do we go on paying for comprehensive health care free at the point of need as health care gets more and more expensive yeah. and the population gets older? Mm -hmm. Do you accept that that's a pretty serious problem given, you know, from the perspective of a chancellor? <laughs> you know, who's trying to divvy up public funds? So, first of all, okay, so three things I would say. So, any plan for the NHS is expensive. Yeah. Any change you want to make, it's an enormous system, and it gets more expensive every single year because medical things change, healthcare develops, our expectations develop, right? So, absolutely, plus we have an aging population. So, that absolutely anybody putting any kind of plan for, for the NHS is going to be looking at an enormous sum of money. Secondly, um, I think what we need to focus on is the fact that one of the reasons we're in the situation we are right now is because it has been neglected so significantly by this current government. We're in a situation now where we have an over £10 billion repair bill in the NHS in England alone because they've just let walls crumble. In the last 18 months, we've had hundreds of sewage leaks onto A&E departments, maternity units, cancer wards, because they're not fixing the basic things. So one of the reasons that this plan would cost a lot of money is because Things haven't been paid for, right? So that's number two. And number three is, and I talk about this in the book, we need to think about what is written in the NHS constitution. What is the promise of the NHS? Because we're not fulfilling it at the moment. And my feeling about it is that politicians are either going to have to make these radical changes in order to fulfill those promises, which are free healthcare, healthcare which is comprehensive, healthcare which is equal. Um, or they hold a public referendum and they say to the public, would you like us to change the NHS constitution because we're not going to provide these things anymore? Because currently they're not providing the things, but the public want them to. And when the public ask for it, they're told it's going to cost too much. And I think that's nonsense. You know, I think we need to be holding these politicians to account, regardless of the party. Do you think a referendum would be necessary before switching or moving to the kind of insurance-based system, which uh, we do read about, not just in the States, but a, more of a mixed system, a la France and Germany? 
Absolutely. I think there should have been a referendum, you know, before last summer, before they broke the NHS into 42 units. I think they should have held a referendum before introducing private finance initiatives that have landed us with, in total, £80 billion worth of debt for buildings which were worth £12 billion. They didn't do any of these things. Politicians have got away with this because we are in a situation where our public healthcare system is, is managed in a short-term way by whichever government comes in. And if you look at what the public wants, actually, regardless of who they vote for, most people want the NHS to survive and most people believe in the principles. And so politicians aren't following what the public want them to be doing at the moment. There's so much unhappiness about it. You know, and I think sometimes, and I'm, this is slightly defensive, as a campaigner and as a campaign organisation, we get boxed in. You know, people often like to label us in a particular mm -hmm. way. You're socialists, you're activists, you're blah, 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 blah. You know, you've got a political... We've got no political agenda other than wanting the NHS to survive and wanting people to be safe. We're not politicians. We never will be politicians, right? What, what we see politicians doing is not safe, we, and we want to call attention to that. I do want to ask you a little bit about how it's been for you making the transition from being a doctor... Uh, to, to a campaigner because I, we actually had a think in, in here a couple of uh, weeks ago honouring uh, campaigners who'd won. Remind me of the name of the prize. Anyone? Sorry? Sheila McKechnie. Sheila McKechnie Prize, yes. And, and it was a really interesting insight into the fact that it's never simple and it's never, never stress-free, quite the, quite the opposite. <laughs> but I, I would like to hear from... Anybody else who's had experience or, or, or of um, private health care at taxpayers' expense, as it were, and whether you think that it's adequate or, or whether your experience supports the finding of this Lancet study published last year that, broadly speaking, care is, is lower quality? Yes. Do you want a, a, one of these? Yeah. I'm doing, I, my voice is really Your voice is... There you go. Thanks. Um, I'm Ash. I'm a consultant in acute medicine. So very little private health care going on in acute care from what I see. But I go back to that story of tendering. And once we open up the offer of profit from acute health care, from uh, primary health care, we will fail because we don't have the expertise in tendering. I have seen my trust again and again and again go for the cheapest provider from a private provider because people who are expert at tendering for contracts will write the right thing to get the job. And that happens so frequently. I mean, on a three monthly basis for clinical systems, for e-prescribing, for pharmacy services, just the smallest things. And these are within a one small trust in North London. We do not have the expertise to know who are going to do this better. So we should not allow it until we have that expertise or not allow it at all. But we've jumped in and go, oh, that sounds really good. They've told us they can do it for this much money. And to a ICS, or as was Strategic Health Authority, or CCG, that appeals to the bottom line for this financial year. Yeah. And we keep running to financial year to financial year. And cost versus value. Mm -hmm. We have got it so wrong when we talk about healthcare. We know that public healthcare is the cheapest way of providing the most healthcare to the most people. But we've somehow failed to make that argument. We keep, and it's happened tonight, we keep talking about cost, expense. It is such a cheap way of doing healthcare. And the broader benefits to having a healthy population as well yeah. get completely missed. If you think about the state of the country and the state of people's health and that healthy people are more productive and will help the economy, that seems to have been completely lost in recent years, doesn't we it? Never, we never talk about nationalised health service as a wealth generator, mm. which is what it is. Yeah. Because those arguments of how, especially the Conservative Party have talked about how we use healthcare, you know, choice, 
yeah. is built around people who are not the main users of healthcare. Mm. It's built around people who are using healthcare around their healthy working lives. Mm. And actually, that's not the majority of our, our, you know, of healthcare users. So actually, get it right for the majority, the people with the greatest needs, the people who suffer health inequalities, and the trickle down will go to those other people who want the best services. Yeah. But we've we've we always seem to pander to the people who can choose mm -hmm. and people with complex health needs, people who I meet in A and E every single day with dementia, with mental health problems, they are not the people who can make choices. And we are taking away the holistic approach to their care and it will it, it will fail us and it will fail them. Yeah. Thank you. Can I come back while you have the mic to what, in a sense, was your starting point? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but morale. How's morale in your team? And, and you, you mentioned what made me think of this was you, you mentioned that public healthcare provision is is the cheapest, the most cost effective. In fact, that being the case, do you feel abused rather than used as the provider of that healthcare? <laughs> Maybe, no, I don't actually. And every day I'm in there looking after people, I don't feel abused. And I feel like I'm part of the same tribe of people as the people I look after. So it's not, it's not an us and them. And having to explain, I stopped apologizing years ago. I don't apologize for the long stay. I say, I hate that this is happening. You don't apologise for that? For, for the long stays in A&E. Okay. I, I, right, right. It's, not my, it's not my responsibility any longer. This is a system in which we are all being forced to work, and it is brutal, and the burnout levels are huge. There's often... Sorry to cut yeah. in. There's often um, a line that comes from the media or from politicians that tries to divide patients and NHS staff. For the... First point, I mean, NHS staff make up 5% of the population. Mm. They are the population. But secondly, as Ash was saying just now, um, the staff are dealing with a set of circumstances which are not of their making. They've been created by politicians and they're doing a fantastic job working incredibly hard within an incredibly difficult working environment. But, I mean, I would very rarely come across an NHS staff member who blames the patients for any of the conditions. I think there's a pretty general view now that um, it's not the patient's fault either, you know? Things have been cut back so significantly that, you know, there's sometimes nonsense in the media about patients approaching healthcare and they didn't need to and they're clogging up A&Es. It's just, you know, if somebody goes to A&E, even if it's... an even if they didn't need to, they're, they're going into our public healthcare system because they've got a problem and they, they mm -hmm. want some help, even if that help is reassurance. It would be a very unusual staff member who would get cross about that. The staff members are very understanding about the fact that, you know, we have this fantastic system. One of the best things about the NHS is that you can go to A&E if you're worried. And mm -hmm. sometimes you didn't need to be there in the first place. How fantastic. You can go home again. You know, that's wonderful. Because someone in the States might not feel the ability to do that. They'd probably sit at home and try and over-the-counter medication. And we know what happens there. In the States, it's the biggest cause of bankruptcy. Over f half a million families every single year go bankrupt because of medical problems. We don't want that here. It's, it's not going to be good for anybody. No, absolutely. I remember interviewing a guy called Wendell Potter. Have you ever heard of yeah, him? Yeah, I've got his book. Oh, right. Yeah. And absolutely heart-rending descriptions of, of doctors giving their time at county fairgrounds and oh. queues of cars yeah. arriving with people needing everything from a cataract to a, I don't know, yeah. tooth out. Yeah. And he wept. Yeah. I mean, the staff weeping, you know, maybe not right here, right in this room, but there's staff crying now. The staff leaving, leaving profession, moving abroad, retiring early, because the stress of working in a system where you're meant to be providing one thing, but you're not given the tools to provide it, that, you know, the stress and the strain that puts on people is unbelievable. It's, it's not right. Um, and staff, and I'm, you know, as an advocate of the staff, staff struggle to speak up sometimes it's mm -hmm. difficult working in the nhs is a fantastic place but also it can be a brutal working environment there's not a lot of room 
sometimes because things are so busy and people as they get more and more stressed out have less capacity to listen to one another it's very very difficult and so some people are just turning away from it and leaving and you know there's, there's a lot of talk at the moment um, about numbers of new staff we're going to get you know, we're going to get 5,000 of these people or 10,000 of these people. And there's very little focus on the fact that we're losing this absolute wealth of knowledge, experience that we already have. You know, because if you look at it in a graph, one new doctor equals one who had 30 years experience but is less because they're having difficult mental health problems, for example. That person with 30 years experience, we've lost them. And, and a member of staff who has that amount of experience is so valuable. It, it's not, you know, that's lost by politicians as well, I think, at the moment. I think part of the problem is, though... Have you got a, have you got a, a mic? Just to... <coughs> part of the problem is that the, I personally think the political system is working against the NHS. They're not interested in recognising and reformatting or kind of building it back up again because if you look at it in context a lot of people have earned a lot of money out of private contracts matt hancock during the pandemic 40 million to an ex-pub landlord that was a friend of his i mean i could go on for hours about lots of contracts that were given out that were you know not fit for purpose michelle moan you mentioned her earlier on there's there's i personally don't think there's any interest or any benefit to them to actually rescue this i also think they lost interest when the nhs stopped being in sexy calls and the you know the the when you look at the flow of information from general media from politicians and down what they do is they take it out of context people are having to go at a and e and they're waiting hours and some of them only need to see you know a doctor for antibiotics there's nearly 10,000 gp vacancies in england alone at the moment out of 26,000 people can't get to see their gp it's not because they're not bothered. We don't have the GPs. When you look at the costs of people moving to Australia, the fact that the other day there was a strike of junior doctors and there was a um, billboard going past on a, on a truck advertising jobs in Australia for £130,000 starting. They certainly don't get that here. There are lots of issues around. I'm not saying the NHS is perfect. It's not. But it is actively being dismantled in front of our eyes. We work with 9,000 NHS staff a week. Many of them are actively feeling very low morale, depressed, anxious. Many are suicidal. We have lots that are actively suicidal. They are burnt out. They're exhausted. Some of it's trauma. And not just from the pandemic. It goes before and after that. And the whole... It's just... It's immoral because it's such, it can be such an amazing system. Mm. And as the lady over there said, you know, about it being cost effective, we are heading with our eyes shut into a situation where private healthcare will be the norm. Mm. And right. nobody's talking about it, and yet people want to, but no one's addressing it. No one will put it out in the media. We, you know, we fight tooth and nail to get statistics and things out there. People don't want to know about it. We did a campaign called Hopeline 19, where general public could leave messages for NHS and frontline workers saying how you know grateful they were and their own experiences of the NHS. We had 20,000 phone calls in three days. It wow. barely breached general media because people weren't interested in it because it was a good story and it was positive news. And yet, lots of staff phoned it, thousands phoned it, and lots of Joe Public phoned in. But it just, people don't want it. They want to see the, the headlines, this is really awful and the NHS is not fit for purpose and it's going to cost lots of money. The government have an active agenda not to make this work. That is my personal opinion. Well, you mentioned the, the lorry driving past with the job ads in Australia and, and staff at all levels leaving for other walks of life, other, other countries. Uh, let, let's talk about staffing, um, Julia and Ash, if you want to pitch in. Um, is that a form of creeping privatisation? Because where there are gaps that have to be filled in surgeries, but particularly in hospitals, if I'm not mistaken, they're often filled by agency staff. Do you regard that as a form of creeping privatisation? Is, is that where, where we're going? Do you want to go first, Ash? I, I, think, it, I think it relates to cost and value of the healthcare staff that we have working in the NHS. Let's give Ash a mic. Oh, OK. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. Um, I think it relates to, you know, how much we're willing to train enough of the people to provide the care for the population we have. So realistically, we need 
huge increase in doctors, nurses, allied health professionals to meet the needs of an aging population. That is going to cost a lot of money. There has been a cut of 40% of the budget for Health Education England, who supervise the training of healthcare professionals. There are limits on the number of trainees that I can recruit. There are limits on, you know, I can have a contract for 12 months, but I can't have a permanent contract because, you know, th that person may not stay and we're not sure if we've got the budget line next year. I'll lose that advanced practitioner or that clinical fellow to Australia very quickly. <coughs> and those gaps and the discomfort and the disquiet and the just sheer exhaustion of my junior colleagues, of course there's going to be market forces then. Yeah. And they will say, I will work and I will do this work, but it's nearly intolerable work because of the, the pressure they're under. So yeah, they're gonna ask for 100, 120 pounds and people are going to see there's money to be made. I work in acute care, we're underserved. I get an email every single day offering me between five and 7,000 pounds a week to go and work as an agency locum somewhere in the UK. But I decide not to, but given where I am and the value that's put on the work that I do, why wouldn't I? <coughs> I wouldn't, but that creep, that pressure is just there every single day. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what, what Ash says. And it's, it's difficult because this, the permanent staff have been treated really badly for a really long time now. And they've had massive real-term pay cuts. As consultants in England since 2008, 2009 have had a 34.9% real-terms pay cut. It's enormous. And so, in a way, you know, it's obvious that people are going to experience that and experience the stress and strain at work. And eventually, they'll be tipped over into thinking, is this the right thing for me? Should I be looking for somewhere else? Not even just for themselves. Quite honestly, it's, it's often people who I hear from who say, you know, I'm doing this because my husband can't, can't take me being this stressed. You know, it's affecting my relationship or I'm worried about my children. And I don't see them enough. You know, there's all these kinds of reasons people make these decisions. But, um, but as Ash says, if you, if you do that to a workforce for long enough, for over 10 years, um, people are going to start making personal choices to keep themselves, quite frankly, safe. That, that's what I hear. Um, and some of those people go into the locum agency workforce. Some of them work for a private provider themselves. Some of them move abroad. Um, something I do struggle with a little bit, because I get this a little bit online, is this implication that it's the staff's responsibility to continue working regardless of the conditions and they just need to be a foot soldier and put up with it all. Mm -hmm. And that's nonsense because um, the workers in the NHS are workers. They should be yeah. paid fairly for what they do. They should be respected and treated well, and, and they're not. So it's up to the government to make the job more um, supportive of, of a workforce, I think. My partner is a clinical psychologist in the NHS, so it's under a slightly different um, contract to doctors. He's getting a promotion. He's running the uh, adult clinical psychology uh, services in Hackney. Guess what he gets for his promotion? Nothing for five years. Zero. I work in the private sector. If anyone offered me a promotion where my pay came in after five years, I would instantly quit my job. In, like That would be utterly unacceptable. Can you imagine? But that pay grade doesn't even account for inflation over five years, and you don't see any of it. Now, that is relying on the goodwill and you know, kindness and generosity of these people who take pride in their work. But if you ask anyone in the private sector, would you accept this as a work contract? They wouldn't, because it's fundamentally unfair. Mm -hmm. And I think that the heart of this issue for me is, it is immoral what we're doing. Like, mm -hmm. should we be thinking about healthcare as a cost optimization system, or is it about driving the fundamental good of human life, which is if you are healthy, you can do anything. If you have health, no health, you can do nothing. And why are we optimizing like we're a private organization when that's not what health is about? It's not that at all. That's absolutely key. And I think that's the point here. When, you know, when we talk about value, it's so easy to get 
trapped in these arguments of this doctor's working for such and such an hour or like this is going to cost lots of money at the net and we don't have it in the budget. If we thought about this in a broader way, really, like what do we want from our society? How do we want our society to function? It wouldn't look like this. Like the health inequality is extraordinary and it's scary and it's getting worse. And then we need to have these big conversations and, you know, I think it's up to the public to make those decisions, you know? It's not up to politicians. That's, that, I guess that's the reason I wrote the book. I feel like there's not enough information getting out to people about what's happening. People get divided and it becomes politicised. And actually, we could all just have a, a conversation with one another. We seem to have lost the ability to do that. We certainly have. Uh, the flag's gone up, which doesn't mean we're completely out of time. Sarah, did you want to uh, say yeah, something about it? Yes. Um, so I, this is slightly off track of where the current questions were going, so forgive me. But so I know in the US lately, there's been an emphasis on bringing in non, like doctor level medical professionals into hospitals more and more. So like physicians assistants and nurse practitioners as a way of kind of, I guess, alleviating the amount of work. And I was wondering, thinking money aside, is that something that you think would really work in hospitals in the UK? How do you feel about that approach to when it comes to patient care and that kind of stuff and when it, and how it kind of comes to, I guess, maybe having a bit more of like a community health and public health focus. And yeah. so putting some of the practitioner, I don't know what the right, right word is, on people that aren't just doctors, but kind of having another set of medical professionals within the hospital system to help with that. Yeah, I mean, there's a few doctors in, in the room, like other people might want to talk about this. My personal view on this, and it's not an attack on any group of staff members at all, is that there's a move at the moment, just like there is in the US, to de-skill the workforce and reduce the cost. And so we're probably moving into a system where you have fewer senior doctors, for example, around managing a workforce of uh, less highly skilled professionals of whatever background. And like Ash was saying, if you're the consultant on call, um, you're probably supervising a number of people now who aren't always in a training scheme, haven't always had the same level of experience they might have done a decade ago. So there is definitely a move to that in this country. In terms of that affecting patient care, I don't really feel equipped to talk about this because I'm not working in service at the moment. I don't know if anybody else wants to... It does. So in here, when my dad was in hospital, everybody on the wall, there were two doctors, one sister, and there must have been, say, 30 patients at least. Every single other member of staff was a healthcare assistant, and they were doing all the observations, doing all the charts. They were put under immense pressure and put in situations they should never have been put in because they didn't have the experience or the knowledge. And I think the difficulty is they're trying to help each other out and do different things, but patient care dropped massively. And also, you get people, you talk about the workforce, there are a lot of overseas workers coming into the UK and they don't have the experience of our healthcare system and maybe some of our cultures, but also they're put in very difficult positions in the care that they're asked to give. And so they just come in for one and a lot of them walk out. I went in several times and had to stay with my dad overnight because he couldn't be left on his own and there were no staff to sit with him. And this was in Kings in London, so it's not a little hospital in the middle of nowhere. It's happening all across the country. Corridor care, all of these different horrible things that people are having to go through. The general public think that people being cared for in corridors is kind of because it's an emergency. No, it's a standard procedure now. It's even got a name, and they even do training in it. This is nothing What's new. Corridor care. So if somebody... When my dad was in hospital, there were people in the corridor for days on end on beds, trolleys, what have you. But that's not an official term, right? That's yeah, it is. Oh, yes, it is. If you look at the RCA... It's just black humour. No, it's, yeah. called, it's called corridor care. There are papers on it about how to do it, and they train staff in how to do corridor care. One of the hospitals this winter was training junior doctors of how to provide life-saving treatment in the back of an ambulance in an ambulance bay because they recognised yep. they weren't going to get lots of the patients into the A&E department because the A&E department was clogged up. And so they got an old ambulance and they kitted it out and they had people running simulation training in, in an ambulance bay because that was the reality. You know, I heard about hospitals where one consultant would be in the ambulance bay their yep. entire shift because... 
the, the patients are there and they're not going to get inside the hospital, so you better get used to treating them in the back of an ambulance. I mean, it's, it's scary. People being on drips in car parks yeah. and in their cars because, you know, there isn't the care there. There's not the staff. There's not the space. Okay. The flag has gone up, which usually means we have five minutes. I want to, we haven't even got to asking you about your experience as a campaigner, which I wanted to. The other thing, that'll have to wait, the other thing that we haven't got to, but I do want to give you the last word on this, is how you see this playing out, given the sort of ambiguous signals that we're getting from Labour. Let's just assume Labour wins, right? Let's just assume that, broadly speaking, they are more in favour of an old-style, old properly-funded NHS if, if the money's available. But, but you have your doubts, um, and, and we've had some extraordinary stories of crushing workloads, devastating blows to morale. Um, is it like the frog in the frying pan? I think it may be an apocryphal frog in a frying pan that just gets, I'm talking about the service generally and the staff in it, this gets hotter and hotter until it realises it's over. And, and, and then we really will have a, a total collapse. Or, or is, it, is it a longer, grislier, even grislier story that you foresee? If Labour come into government, I've been reading about this a lot because I wrote an article about it yesterday, actually. I was, I was reading a speech that Keir Starmer made about three weeks ago in Essex about his future plans for the NHS, and some of it does look fantastic. He's got really big plans for changing technology and investing in various areas and doing more joined-up care. I mean, if it comes to pass, let's see. Um, something that worries me slightly, well, it worries me quite a lot, is that he made a pledge when he was becoming Labour leader to remove the private outsourcing, and he dropped the pledge, and he's dropped a few other pledges, so I think difficult to know with his proposals at the moment how much they're subject to change you know I think there's a lot of people wondering that but the other thing worrying me is that there's not enough focus on the workforce from what I'm seeing from Labour at the moment um, the reality is, is that we've got an absolutely crippled workforce we're missing 124,000 full-time staff in England alone at the moment and of the staff who are currently there a huge proportion of them have low morale and are thinking about leaving um, if I was to come in and run the health service, the first thing I would be doing is looking at the staff because okay. none of his grand plans are going to come off if he doesn't look after the staff properly. Um, he needs to really take the trade union seriously and what they're saying about pay. And some of the tone of communication that I've seen, particularly from West Streeting, I mean, I don't know what everybody else thinks in this room, but I have found it really unhelpful. I think if you're coming in and you're trying to support and listen and learn from a group of people who've been keeping the country safe, then work with the unions, work with the healthcare professionals and the experts, listen. It feels like he's just going on the attack. And um, watching that, I mean, it just doesn't feel good. I, I don't know. I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. Well, if you've got views on where streeting, have another come, have another drink, and come and share them uh, with us. But um, Julia, thank you very much for coming in. I've learned a tremendous amount, which I will pass on to my son with encouragement to stick at it. Well, can I say something yeah. finally? Because I think it's good to fi to finish on a hopeful note. Yeah. There are more and more people talking about this, and more and more people connecting. I mean, we talk to a lot of people online, but. Um, it's affecting people in their lives now, their personal lives, they're asking questions and I think we do have a moment to change things now and I would say, I mean, I'm not working clinically as a doctor, there is still, the medical profession is a fantastic career and, you know, we've got to rebuild this service so that it's a good place to work again and a good place for patients but, I mean, it's fantastic that he's become a doctor and we should be really grateful and we, you know, do you know, like, yet, yeah. but it, it can't all be doom and gloom. We, you know, we built the NHS in the first place. We could rebuild it. On that note, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>